So what we want to do is test the causal role of particular regions of the brain in a normal subject. Better yet, in a part of the brain we choose. Okay? So the only method that you can do that, that you can use right now uh, in normal subjects is called transcranial magnetic stimulation. Um, basically what you do is you take a metal coil, like a whole bunch of a wire wrapped around and around and embedded in uh, plastic and connected to a very big capacitor. You stick it next to your head and you push a, actually step on a lever that discharges the capacitor, which basically runs a huge current through that coil. I know we're always talking about the right hand rule, but here comes the right hand rule again. So here's this current going through the coil. What is that going to do to underlying brain tissue? Big magnetic field. Oh, I left some details out. The current goes, um, it, it's very rapid, very high current, and it goes back down to zero in less than a millisecond. So huge transient in the current. This gas is going to do stuff to neurons. Neurons are conductors. You're making this very rapid, huge transient magnetic field that goes from zero up to a, over a Tesla and back down to zero in less than a millisecond. That's a massive magnetic field transient that's going to induce current in underlying brain tissue. Yeah? Anybody want to volunteer? Um, it, it can be done quite safely. That is within a, 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 an acceptable margin of safety. I've done this to myself tens of thousands of times. You can watch me getting zapped with TMS on my website, Nancy's Brain Talks. I'm not going to do that now. It's kind of amusing. Um, uh, and so what you have to do is you have to be careful. You have to do it within limits where um, various safety tests in animals have shown that uh, this doesn't seem, as far as anybody can tell, to produce long-term damage. Okay? And also the fact that the disruption is very brief, usually a few tens of milliseconds, is powerful also in enabling us to make inferences about brain function. Okay? Okay. So um, that's TMS. Um, and um, here's an early version of a TMS device from a long time ago. They've gotten much more sophisticated since then. Um, here's a modern version. It looks like a torture device. It isn't really. He's just holding his head still on a chin rest. This guy here, my friend Tony Rowe, is getting, um, getting zapped by uh, one of his colleagues with a coil stuck next to his head. All this stuff is just to, so we can hold his head still so this guy can try to position the coil in the right place over his head. Okay? Um, all right. Um, the spatial resolution of this method isn't really known, but it's not great. Maybe a couple centimeters. No, not terrible, but not fabulous either. Um, there are um, devices now that enable you to place the coil outside somebody's head directly over a brain region that you have previously found in that person with functional MRI. So you scan with them with functional MRI, you take all their data, and you use external markers to sync up the position of the coil to the position of different brain regions. Okay, I'm skipping all the details, but you can imagine how you would, how you would do that. So you can position it. Uh, pretty precisely in regions you care about, okay? And so, um, can this tell us anything about face recognition? Okay. Starting around 20 years ago, when I first had access to a TMS device, I did what lots of my colleagues in other places were doing at the same time. We grabbed that TMS coil, we stuck it right there over the fusiform face area, cranked it to the max, and tried to make ourselves transiently prosopagnosic. No dice doesn't work. Big bummer. Um, then, uh, and here's the problem. Here's my fusiform face area, right there in a horizontal slice. And you can see it's not right out next to the skull. It's in a centimeter or two. And so you can't reach that sucker. Big bummer. Okay? But then, uh, David Pitcher, shown here, had a very good idea. He figured some poetic license from Stephen Sills. If you can't zap the region you love, love the region you can. Namely, look at this guy out here, right out on the surface, also responding selectively to faces, a region called the occipital face area. It's right out near the skull. It's not as big or as selective or as um, robust as the fusiform face area, but there it is, and you can reach it, and David did. So here's what he did. And just as a sidebar, I think this is true of many, if not most, of the questions we care about in human cognitive neuroscience. We can think up great questions, but often we don't have the methods to answer them. 
So you have to be a pragmatist in our field, and you have to adjust your questions a little bit to do, answer the questions you can. Okay? All right, so that's what David did. So here's what he did. He used a same different task. So here's a trial. There are two faces presented successively, face one, face two. And the task is just to say, are they identical or different? He designs the task so it's difficult, but people can perform above chance. Okay? He then zaps with PMS at different intervals after the onset of the second face, right over the occipital face area. Okay? Little magnetic pulse. Boom, boom, boom. Question is, what happens to accuracy on the same different task? Okay? So what you see here is accuracy at that task um, when you zap right over the occipital face area versus the dark bar is vertex, which is a control location on the top of the head. So what's that telling us? Absolutely. That's cool, isn't it? And it's not just anywhere. After all, I should say a little bit what TMS feels like. It kind of feels like that. Like, it's not great. The official word of people who work on it is it causes discomfort. They don't say pain. It's kind of nasty, depending on where you hit. If you do the frontal lobes, it really hurts. But back here, it's like, okay, whatever. Bang your head a little bit. It's fine. Um, so that's distracting, right? You're trying to do this task. You're looking at this face. It's hard to see. And somebody's like whacking your head, right? That's why you need vertex as a control, okay? So notice that performance doesn't go down a lot. Maybe like 85% correct to like 78% correct. Not amazing, but something. It's a great question. Vertex is not a perfect control unless you showed that it was you know, no more distracting or painful than other locations. This is a problem. It's better than another control people sometimes use, which is called sham stimulation. So you take the coil like this, like this means the current is running like that, and you turn it like this. Now you're zapping the air. It still makes a click. People use sham stimulation as a control. Not David, he knows better, but other people do this. You'll see it in papers. It still makes a click, but it doesn't feel like anything. Bad control for just the reason you say. So it's always something you need to worry about, okay? That's a start. That's pretty cool. But here's the other neat thing you can do. Remember, I said that David zapped at several different latencies after stimulus onset. That enables us to ask not just if that region is causally involved in face perception, but when, okay? And so that's the rest of the data here. And so what you see is he zapped, it's actually done with a double pulse in this experiment, like zap, zap, either at 20 and 60 milliseconds after stimulus onset, or this case is 60 and 100, 100 and 140, and you see that only when you zap at 60 and 100 do you disrupt performance by zapping that location. What does that mean, that, that the fact that this disruption happens only at 60 to 100? What have we just learned about the occipital face area besides that it's causally involved in face perception? Maybe other things, according to this, I haven't told you yet. There's a very particular window of time. Information comes into the eyes, it's going up the processing pipeline. It, you only need that region for that little window of time as the information is getting processed through there. Okay? So what we're trying to figure out in this course is Inform an information processing story about how perception and cognition works. It's presumably a series of stages that involve different brain regions and that are engaged at different, doing different computations at different points after stimulus onset. Okay, and this tells us that little bit is involved just in this little time window. Cool, huh? Everybody got that? You guys are going silent. I don't know if this is boring or opaque. In fact, the effect size is tiny. It only goes from like 85 to 78 or something. And so, of course, we'd love a method that just really walloped it and took that down to like chance, 50%, right? Uh, the trouble is the methods that do that start to get into the dangerous zone. So it's a trade-off between remaining in a safe zone where you're not going to mess up the person and getting an effect you can actually measure. It means it's a step in the pathway. There's an ambiguity here. Because the disruption is not total, we don't know whether there are other bypassing pathways that can do some of the work alternately filling in for this guy, or whether it's just that you have to go through that region, but the TMS effect is weak. It could be either of those. That's a very good point. All we've shown here is evidence that that region plays some causal role, not that it does everything at that stage. Okay? All right. Um, all right, so advantages of TMS. 
stronger evidence for direct causal role of that part of the region than any of the activation studies, okay? Just like it's also true for patients. Uh, but unlike patients, this method can be used on normal subjects and it has good temporal resolution. We can ask exactly when a region is engaged in some task, which we can't do with patients at all because they have brain damage for after they have it, it doesn't come back. Uh, and so that means the idea that maybe after brain damage there's some reorganization of the brain is less likely here. Reorganization isn't likely to happen in the course of a uh, short experiment. Okay. Um, disadvantages, um, nobody really understands exactly what happens to the neurons underneath the coil. It's pretty clear that it does something, but exactly what it does isn't known. Um, it doesn't reach very far below the scalp. That's why David Pitcher zapped the OFA, not the FFA. Though the asterisk is to tell you that the amazing Ed Boyden is now working on this. He's working on devices to zap in the middle of the brain. It will be totally cool if that works. Stay tuned. Um, spatial resolution is not fantastic. It's okay, but it'd be nice if it was better. Um, and so, again, detect a pattern. This is a problem. What are we going to do? 